Welcome to In the Adirondack Library, the Adirondack Experiences virtual book series featuring recently published books about the North Country. I'm Jenny Ambrose, the Museum's Director of Archives and Special Collections. Thank you for joining us for the third program in the series, which explores Adirondack life, history, and culture through the work of a diverse group of regional authors. All of the books in the series will join thousands of other books about the Adirondacks lining our library shelves. I hope you will join us every month on Monday evenings throughout the winter for conversations with our authors. Books in the series are available on the museum's online store and at your local public library. A full schedule as well as information about the books and authors are available on our website theadkx.org. The museum is delighted that Mitch Tyke, station manager of North Country Public Radio and host of North Words, has agreed to conduct the author interviews for the series. His weekly show, North Words, features conversations with people from around the North Country about what makes living here special and unique. Enjoy Mitch's thoughtful, engaging interviews during the museum's monthly Monday night book programs and in episodes of his podcast every Friday afternoon. This evening, it is my great pleasure to introduce Amy Godin, author of The Black Woods, Pursuing Racial Justice on the Adirondack Frontier. Amy is an independent scholar, longtime Adirondack Life Magazine contributor, and a special friend of the museum. She's published scores of articles about Adirondack ethnic and social history. In addition, she has lectured widely on migratory labors, immigrants, ethnic neighborhoods and enclaves, peddlers, paupers, pilgrims, squatters, strikers, undocumented immigrants, and other Adirondack non-elites. Tonight, Amy will provide a brief illustrated introduction to her book and then answer questions from Mitch Tyke and members of the audience. We welcome your participation. So please submit your questions at any time in the program through the Q&A feature. And now I'll turn the virtual podium over to Amy Godin. Thanks, Jenny. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, good. I want to thank you for ADKX's interest in this topic and for producing the fall author series and putting me in such great company. A few viewers watching this might recall this museum's early link to this story when Dreaming of Timbuktu, a traveling exhibition I curated for the social justice group John Brown Lives, was invited to premiere at this museum in 2001. The research I generated for that project made me confident I might have enough for a small pamphlet. A quarter century and a two pound book later, here we are. Here, this is what it turned into, it's, it's thick. But before I talk about the book and dive into the PowerPoint, I'd like to sketch the backdrop. The history of the Blackwoods might seem to start in 1846 when a radical upstate abolitionist, Garrett Smith, owner of some three quarters of a million acres in New York state, launched his distribution of 120,000 acres to 3,000 poor landless black New Yorkers from all over the state. But a better starting point might actually be 1821, the year of New York's second constitutional convention, when many of the rules regarding suffrage rights were review, reviewed and revised. Poor black and white New Yorkers had long endured stiff voting restrictions, but this year something shifted. White voters gained the franchise, rich and poor, pretty much free and clear. Black New York men saw their restriction more than double. From this year until 1870, only black men who could prove they owned $250 in real property could vote, a restriction so onerous it effectively disenfranchised all of Black New York. And no hope of reversing this when voters had their say in the fall. It was overwhelmingly endorsed. As of 1821, voting rights in New York were now explicitly, emphatically racialized and voteless Black New Yorkers would not gain a chance to challenge this until the next state constitution 
Convention in 1846. The land baron and equal rights reformer Garrett Smith was well aware of the power of the anti-suffrage cohort in the state assembly, and he knew what to expect. For all the hard work of the black suffrage activists, their petition drives, their colored men's political conventions, their white allies in the state assembly, they would not gain the votes to rescind the racist property requirement. Downstate business interests were too invested in their dealings with the slave states to support a change of law that might empower a new black anti-slavery lobby. Immigrant voters were also not disposed to reward black laborers, their workplace rivals with voting rights that were equal to their own. The bitter upshot in, 19, in 1846, black New Yorkers without landed wealth were once again, once again denied civic representation. They were invisible, inaudible, mute. Enter Garrett Smith's great plan. In August of that year from tiny Peterborough, New York, this radical reformer cooked up an unprecedented way to help black prospective voters meet the hated property requirement. Quote, since the state has determined that black men must become landholders, that they may be entitled to vote, they will become landholders, he reasoned. Vote they will, cost what it will. Smith had inherited a load of wild Adirondack land from his father and bought plenty more himself. But by 1846, he realized his land-rich investment wasn't really working out. He put much of it up for sale. Buyers did not bite. He lived too far away from it to manage it well, and so much property embarrassed him. This new plan would not only relieve him of a tax burden, it would enact a kind of environmental distributive justice offer a homeowning solution for urban black New Yorkers who couldn't hope for affordable and decent housing in the congested city slums. It would model interracial collaboration and initiate affirmative action a century before the strategy had a name. And it would facilitate access to the ballot. As Smith wrote his Black Friends in Manhattan, I know poor white New Yorkers are just as badly off as white people, I'm paraphrasing him now, but white men can vote. Poor black men can't. This disadvantage tips the balance. With these land gifts, I can redress a racialized injustice. I can even out the field. Were any of the um, of Smith's gift lots worth $250? $50 is more like it, but with labor and improvements, a wild lot might gain the value in due time. Sweat equity was part of Smith's plan too. He could have given bigger gifts, bigger land lots, or just cash that would enfranchise his grantees outright. But Smith had another idea, a bracing encounter with the quote, rigors of the Adirondack wilderness, he wrote, would quote, work out a far better character than if his grantees had an over easy time of it, or as he put it, build their new homes, quote, on fat lands under genial suns. Smith had outdistanced the Calvinism of his youth by the time he gave up land, but not his romantic faith in struggle. New York's northern frontier would be a proving ground of black manhood. And through hands-on exertion, the new made black farmer would compel the respect of his fellow white pioneers. Now here's a map of the um, committee, the land committee districts that, that, well, I'll get to it, but have a look at this map. As to how to make this work, here Smith's extensive anti-slavery network served him well. He reached out to 13 men of prominence in the reform community, some white, more of them black, and tasked these activists to sign up 3,000 prospects for free land who met his terms of eligibility, namely, no drinking, good character, poverty, and a New York address. He broke the agents into four committees and assigned each committee to a region. You can see those regions outlined on this map. And in the, can, well, can you go back for a sec? Thanks. In the upper corner, up near Canada, at the top, near the north of Franklin and Clinton counties, you can see in that blotchy, splotchy patch that straddles Franklin and Essex, um, where the land was that he gave away. It's quite a stretch of land. If it were bigger, you'd see it better, but this is how it looks on a big state map. Elder Charles Bennett Ray, well, 
Smith didn't get his 3,000 names in the few months he hoped. It would take his agents a few years to meet their quotas and identify their eligible grantees, but they rose gamely to the challenge, each as certain of a dazzling outcome as Smith himself. The Manhattan land agent pictured here, Elder Charles Bennett Ray, a longtime proselyte for black husbandry, saw the frontier as an equalizer that would, from sheer necessity, turn white and black pioneers into good neighbors and uh, cooperative fellow farmers. Ray's friend and fellow city agent, Dr. James McCune Smith, one of two black doctors in Manhattan, had closely studied the toll city living, city living took on black mortality and morbidity, and he extolled the environmental advantages of a black removal to the health restoring woods. Frederick Douglass, new to New York's Rochester and now a a uh, land agent, uh, and not a land agent, but a great friend of the giveaway, and he'd been given a grant by Smith himself, promoted Smith's new cause with brio, drawn to the heady romance of the idea and the prospect of challenging white ideas about black indolence and incompetence. And from Troy, the militant abolitionist and agent, Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, who gained his name in anti-slavery circles for his 1843 speech that called on enslaved Americans to arise, arise, flight in slaver, fight enslavers and escape, had especially high hopes for Smith's idea. To the grantees would fall the work of, quote, setting high hopes, excuse me, setting an example of independ independence for black people and demonstrating, quote, the falsity of the old doctrine that we are doomed to be the hewers of, of wood and drawers of water, God's design that every man shall have a home, was theirs to claim, quote, a perfect system of agrarianism, end quote, their duty to install. Garnett's Blackwoods would be a sanctified utopia, a city on a hill. The agents and their allies pitched Smith's gift lands in Black newspapers, at their pulpits, at Black political conventions and meetings in New York City, Buffalo, Albany and Troy. Um, many of these are represented here in these diamonds on this map, and there are plenty more I'm sure I didn't catch in my own research. Press was pretty favorable for it. The dots on this map stand for only some of these meetings. White papers in New York, Vermont, and even Michigan praised Smith's great, quote, scheme of justice and benevolence as well. And, and, I'll break the bad news first. You read any antiquarian account or early 20th century history about this and, um, and you learn in terms here sorrowful, there mocking and impatient, the giveaway was a rapidly revealed failure. Only 50 grantees came north with their families, bringing the head count to about 200. My math is more elastic, but even when I bundle in the outliers, like fellow travelers who got no gift deeds, but still came north, or grantees who settled in the Adirondacks, but not in core neighborhoods in North Elba, St. Armand, and Franklin, or black Southerners who came north with returning Union veterans after the Civil War and were eagerly absorbed into the black households on the ground, even then, I can't pump up the number to more than 250. What went awry? I'll give you two hypotheses and then my own. Those historians who assumed that Garrett Smith's land gifts had to be for fugitives blamed the black pioneers own congenital unfitness for unsupervised labor in harsher weather on a strange frontier, never having had to boss themselves. The ex-slaves were adrift of African descent. They just weren't, they just weren't tough, motivated or educa educable enough to hack it. As Adirondack historian Alfred Donaldson put it in 1922, quote, the attempt to combine an escaped slave with a so-called Adirondack farm was about as promising of agricultural results as would be the placing of an Italian lizard on a Norwegian iceberg. Historians who understood these land gifts were for black New Yorkers, not for ex-slaves or slaves, also racialized the grantee's failure to make use of Garrett Smith's largesse. City bred and city soft, the black pioneers had worked, these historians said, as barbers, tailors, waiters, day laborers in the city. The country life was too much for them. 
So back they drifted to their comfort zone. And in this reading, like the other, was the assumption of some helpless unfitness for Adirondack life, a deeper incapacity. Smith himself said as much in 1857, when Horace Greeley asked him to explain why his giveaway had not panned out, he said, look, if white farmers were getting by on Adirondack land only thanks to their, quote, very hard work and very frugal habits, why, quote, considering the character of the colored people, should we expect them to do much in the Adirondacks? His grantees lacked the right stuff. In other words, his expectations were too high. Indeed they were, but not because his, grant, his gifties were unresourceful. Smith's expectations were too high because he didn't do his homework. The land he gave away was useless to gifties without the means to move to it and work it, and this they didn't have. The cost of bringing a 40-acre farm into production in the mid-1800s averaged $1,500, a figure well beyond the reach of Smith's grantees, beyond the worth of the land itself, and beyond the means, it should be noted, of white wage earners making $1 to $2 a day. In that tough first year on the new farm especially, the grantees needed startup funding to pull them through, buy livestock, tools, fund their migration. And this they never got. In this light, we might judge their absence on the Adirondack frontier less as a failure than the opposite. The grantees knew what they could manage, how much they could afford. This move risked utter destitution. They also knew, as Smith did not, <laughs> just where, after the enactment of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, they felt relatively safe, relatively. It was not in the unfamiliar, unimaginable, overwhelmingly white Adirondack woods. Between their own disabling poverty, reports in black newspapers about devious surveyors and double dealing guides, and the latest threat of pursuit, capture and re-enslavement, no small risk for black New Yorkers whether slave born or not, remember Solomon Northup, born free, they had good reason to stay put in the towns and cities they were used to. But let's put Garrett Smith and his unfeasible high hopes out of the way and consider for a change the experience of the black grantees on this frontier from their perspective. What, what do we find then? 250 people is not a lot, but take this episodic influx on its own terms Consider how it integrated and diversified a previously white frontier and impacted that frontier in ways subtle and profound. We might discover its true value. In these raw, unfinished settlements, the black settlers waged a day-to-day -day campaign to build an equalitarian frontier. They took on voluntary town appointments as fire watchers, road inspectors, tax collectors, constables. They hiked whiteface and camped out with white friends. Lyman E. Epps from Troy, probably the best known grantee with his neighbors, co-founded a town library, two churches, and a singing school. Alex Hazard, pictured here in the um, back row, smoking a pipe, standing tallest guy in the line, he, um, with his brother, organized a village cemetery. He was an Adirondack guide. And um, the cemetery, like Adirondack village schools and churches, was integrated. At land redemption hearings, black farmers vouched for their white neighbors and heard their neighbors vouch for them and vouch again on their behalf when they pushed for raises from the US pension office after the Civil War. Small gains, these wins, no question. This was no post-racial frontier. Upward economic mobility for the descendants of these pioneers was stymied by garden variety racism. They never would be rewarded with the civic posts their white neighbors would assume. No Smith black farmer ever served as county supervisor or school board head. In the late 19th century, when the old agrarian frontier reoriented toward a market economy with company towns, consolidated farms, and migratory lumber gangs, and a burgeoning new service culture ministering to hotels, private camps, and exclusionary clubs. When all of this emerged, the old subsistence farms could not compete. White or black, those farmsteads, the very poorest, vanished. I don't have one picture of a farm 
in this slideshow when it was being worked by Black Adirondack pioneers, not in my book and not in the exhibit either, not of a barn or fence and not of wives or children. No photograph of William Carasaw and his boys hauling sap buckets to a kettle or Lime Epps Jr., a crack shot even as a child, crouched over a buck. Photographs and family portraits were unaffordable. So too were well-built homes that stood the test of time. All I can show you are a few photographs of weary vets on their way to muster in or out of service in the Civil War. Here's Carasaw, middle-aged when he enlisted in Manhattan, and the grantee's son, Josiah, Josiah Hasbrook Jr., bearing a wreath to a cemetery 30 years after the war. But paper, paper is another story. Between newspapers and legal documents, school rolls, poll sheets, tax records, military pensions and deeds, I found my way into this history. Some examples from a 1903 New York Times, an article about a pending lawsuit alerted me to something quite amazing. News of some 400 Smith grantees who, while never moving to their land, were still, right up to 1870, paying taxes on it for its value at the ballot box. And then they sold them off. Why 1870? This was the year Black American men finally gained the right to vote, and the year when these deed holders felt at liberty to give their gift land up. What an offhand, crucial validation of Garrett Smith's land for votes idea. Other revelations from the paper trail, the several grantees who repurposed their gift lots into plans for farm colony schemes of their own. The renowned Stephen Myers, an Albany activist and reformer um, and head of that city's Underground Railroad, founded the Florence Farming and Lumber Colony in Oneida County on his Smith gift lot. Smith gave a little bit of land away in Oneida County too. This was much to Smith's dismay, and a few Black pioneers stayed in Florence for decades. The paper trail is also where I learned how Smith's grantees put his land gifts to use in ways he did not anticipate at all. State and county tax records document a number of Black grantees eagerly engaging in Adirondack land speculation. And while census records do show several pioneers wheeling back to cities, they also reveal grantee settlers pushing on to other farms in New Jersey, Iowa, even the Dakota Territory, and moving many times within the Adirondack region too. Some of you know the name of the Black Enclave near John Brown's North Elba home, Timbuktu, he called it in his letters. But you may not have heard of um, others. Freeman's Home, Blacksville, Negro Brook, Negro Hill, Black Pioneers Touchdown in Franklin, St. Armand, Duane, and Averyville, the cartography of Smith's plan was much more dynamic and expansive than Smith or any of the regional historians ever understood. The last part of my book ponders the influence of historiography on how this story has been represented and misrepresented for about 150 years, well, really until the last 30 or so. I don't think it's accidental that the story of Smith's fabled bust held particular appeal for, his, for historians of the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era. It is, in these early tellings, a reading of the history that underscores who's fit and who isn't for the blessings of the Adirondack Park. The new park, its advocates declared, would ensure the lasting purity of Adirondack water, unpolluted air, robust wildlife, and the wide, silent forest. Never noted Explicitly in this agenda was a concern for the protection of purity of the white race, but one bid for purity invoked another, and the overlap between the interests of the eugenics movement and environmental conservation was wide. What would happen, some conservationists despaired, if the surging tide of immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe, Asia, and the American South overwhelmed and degraded the white Protestant majority? Purity of complexion, purity of Anglo-Saxon, quote, rootstock, cried for strong defenses, too. Getting to my next page here in my last one. And part of this defense meant securing the glorious Adirondack narrative against claimants who had overstepped French Can Canadians, indigenous people, black pioneers. There were people who belonged here and people who just didn't. 
whose role in regional history books, however casual, however light the story, was to enact a kind of trespass, a non-belongingness. That's the story that prevails. Is this changing? I do hope so. Since 2015, the story of the Black settlement that brought John Brown to the region in the first place has had a permanent home at the John Brown farm. An underground history museum in a sable chasm foregrounds the history of the Garrett Smith grantee John Thomas, a self-emancipated slave from Maryland who made the Adirondacks his lifelong home. Stories that the Smith grantees have inspired fresh choreography, an archeological dig, a great American novel by the late Russell Banks, an oratorio and a folk opera, several documentary films, children's plays, a frenzy of new geneal genealogy, two signs for black settlements and one for a brook that bore a racist name for a hundred years, now renamed for a Smith grantee, John Thomas, and a state funded program, the Timbuktu pipeline that brings Brooklyn high school kids into the Adirondacks to learn about black history and some environmental science too. The last chapter in my book launches with a quote by the Austrian historian, Hilde Marie Uhl. Quote, every generation gets the stories it wants to hear, end quote. Are we ready? I think, I pray we may finally be getting close. Thank you. And oh, here's something for you. There's um, a picture here of the book and also, um, what's that called? I forget. What's the word? It's a, it's a QR code. A QR code. If you put your phone up to it and snap it, you can get it from um, Cornell very easily. And of course you can also get it from the Adirondack Museum Bookstore, ADK, ADKX Bookstore, or your local indie bookstore in your own hood. I hope, I hope you'll... Um, have a look. Thanks. And we can go to Mitch. What do you think? Hi. Hi. Well, Amy Godin, thank you so much oh, and sure. um, uh, for a wonderful presentation. I have many questions for you, but I also imagine the more than 100 people in our audience <laughs> tonight may also have some questions. Uh, in fact, we have a couple of them already. Uh, for audience members who haven't uh, yet uh, noticed it, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to type questions into the Q&A and we'll get to as many as we can in the time that we have left. Um, and I want to get to a couple of these questions pretty quickly but I before we get to that let me ask you this question um, you've been studying this uh, you've been studying um, kind of black history in the North Country for so long, and you, you touched on this a little at the beginning of your presentation tonight, but what, what do you think your own biggest blind spots were when you went into this project? Oh, um, I think when I went into it, I assumed that this would be another diversity story like pieces I'd written for Adirondack Life on Jewish peddlers, on um, Italian miners in, in Mineville, Witherby, and Mariah, like um, French Canadian lumberjacks and logging crews. And a racialized story is very different from those. And I had, I had a steep learning curve to understand the difference and that didn't happen right away. It took a lot of reading and a lot of thinking and soul searching about what I took for granted about the black experience that I needed to relearn and I'm still learning. That was one big change for me. Um, so what, what was your discovery process? Not, not that your journey of discovery is equivalent to the, the physical journey of these settlers, um, but how did you pursue this research trail given that, that others had not? I, I mean, it seems like there was a, there was a certain amount of, of blazing your own way uh, to use a, a hiking metaphor. Well, I, I familiarized myself first with what was available in the Adirondack Canon and to go there is not to learn very much, but it is to learn about historiography and how people racialize the story and made it kind of a case study for who really shouldn't be here. That's, I think, the, the, the real message of that, the way that history comes through in the latter part of the 19th century, early 20th too. Um, but then when I went to sources, I met a different story and the thrill was going to the original sources and discovering 
first of all, in the census, the most obvious source that no, the black population didn't come down to one lone family that held on, the Epses of North Elba. In fact, there were more families that held on and more families again in Franklin to the north. And that that story had been completely slighted by historians because it didn't have a John Brown. It didn't have a hero to lead that story into the public view and to make it interesting to white readers. So that took a good bit of searching and that um, that work is still going on. A number of uh, lay historians in Franklin County are really working hard to bring that one to light. And to go into sort of records that weren't conventionally available online, um, uh, especially army um, pension records revealed so much information about black, white, neighborly relations and how really intimate some of these families were. Same thing with tax records down in the state archives, which showed me the collaboration between white and black families with no concern with race, with getting their land back from the state or county for back owed taxes and going to bat for each other with affidavits and depositions that said, yeah, we know this guy, he's worked his land, he's improved it this way, we've known his family forever. This is what he grows. It's really very granular. And that kind of thing popped these small communities to life. That really helped. You mentioned John Brown and a couple of people have uh, have raised the name John Brown in questions that uh, that they've asked. And yeah. I, I guess the biggest question uh, has been has been uh, raised by Eric Lawson in the audience who wants to know, what do you see as the overall impact on the Adirondack, uh, on, on Adirondack black history of John Brown, whose farm was in or near Timbuktu? Well, he gives the Adirondacks a name for a kind of progressive um, culture of tolerance and and courage. And um, I don't want to say for racial tolerance because in most of the, um, though he himself exemplified that, but how he is projected in Adirondack history is for a more generic courage that's depoliticized and it's, it's for freedom in a more abstract sense. His relationships to his black neighbors is mostly buried, except for his friendship with um, the Epps family. It's not really brought to light. So it's tricky. John Brown becomes a, an epic figure of Adirondack independence and standalone belief in conscience and piety and um, sacrifice. That doesn't mean his story is necessarily one of racial justice in the Adirondack narr narrative. I think it takes a while for that to come around. And yeah. also his story is annealed to freeing the slaves and the anti-slavery struggle. His work and friendships with his own black neighbors who are free, but also oppressed by racial um, rulings, that doesn't get any play at all. You don't see, even among, even among the, um, Black pilgrims who come up from Philadelphia every year on his birthday to honor him, they know very little of the Black experience of his neighbors. That's not what they know about. That's not really what they care about because they have no sources that reveal that information to them. And they, they don't mention it in their many, many years of coming up to speak about his heroism, why he came here, which was to help his Black neighbors. Well, and, and it's significant that, that you chose not to put John Brown at the center of this story. Oh, I couldn't have written the story if I had. And that story has been written. That's the reason we know anything about the Black grantees at all is because of John Brown's interest in them. And he figures in um, all books, uh, often glancingly, sometimes with more love and detail, but always he's the center of the story. And I I was only interested in writing this book if I could decenter him and try and put them at the foreground as much as my research would let me. Now, Jessica Law has a has a question uh, related to John Brown, but I think uh, gets at a, a bigger uh, bigger issue here. Um, she writes, John Brown's liberation attempt at Harper's Ferry is often regarded as a failure, but clearly some large success came to fruition for his goals. 
in your estimation, was Timbuktu also a similar failure? Or if it isn't similar, what lessons are there to take from that community to strengthen our own communities today? And I guess that, that gets at the, the, the big picture question of this book is what can we take from what you've discovered to, to inform our broader understanding of, of the Adirondacks, but maybe communities at large as well? That's a big question. I'll do my best. Um, I think Timbuktu is an abject failure if you judge it by Garrett Smith's expectations. Where this story sort of cracks open for me is when I step away from him, just as he steps away from Timbuktu really early on and takes very little interest in its welfare. When I say Timbuktu, I'm really referring to the whole community in all of these little enclaves and, and hamlets. Um, not and and nothing more than that. But if you look at it on its own terms, as I suggested in my talk, you see little gains that were in fact huge gains relative to what the black settlers came from and what the culture they were accustomed to in New York City and in the Hudson Valley and in slavery. Some of them had come up um, from enslaved circumstances in their youth and brought that memory with them and to come up to a place where they could enjoy friendly, trusting relationships with their neighbors, serve to boost their and better their communities, um, raise their children in safety and go to integrated institutions, churches and schools. We take that so for granted and to vote. That's another thing. They were voting. They did get that vote up in the Adirondacks. They would not have got in Troy or New York City. So that's a huge gain. These things need to be put in the scale of where the grantees came from. And I think only if we look at this story diasporically in terms of their origins, the history of um, voter suppression and racism that they brought with them and look at how things change for them in the frontier. Can we begin to think of it as a kind of success, as a, as a big pivot from what they knew? Why they don't stay? Some of them move on to better farms elsewhere. They're still farming. They're still holding tight with farming, a lot of them. So there's success there too, the numbers of them that stick with that. And um, I think it also instances for Adirondackers, the diversified nature of their own culture. And that's an exciting new spin on the sort of monolithic quality of the Adirondack environmental story, which is which really doesn't acknowledge or explore this part of, of the Adirondack legacy. And I think that's kind of thrilling to see this as an early part of Adirondack social history. And we're discovering this all over the country as people do this kind of research. So maybe this story will be a template for other explorations. I hope so. And suggest that maybe if you're more efficient, it won't take this long, but the story is there to be got. <laughs> Well, thanks. It thanks in in significant part to the trail that you have blazed. Uh, well, and a lot of people. Um, we have we have a lot of really good questions. Um, I, I guess um, one of the things that you just talked about, though, spurred a question of mine, and that is. Um, I, I think one of the aspects of these stories that's hardest for me to wrap my head around is the contradictions that you describe that black settlers encountered. They, they encountered racism and bias and animosity when they got to the North Country in a hundred ways, but they were also welcomed into the fold and sometimes protected. How do you think we should view the attitude of the white residents of the Adirondacks to their new black neighbors? Not, simpli not simplistically, with great nuance and forbearance for the complexity of the American experience. I think that uh, this is, you know, one of the problems with Adirondack history is how eager it is to jump on exceptionalist um, visions of itself and to, um, and, and Garrett Smith did this too. He had the idea of the frontier as this gorgeous, romantic landscape that would would fashion and forge black character and redeem black men from city vices and reinvigorate them and meld them with their white neighbors. This was completely off the wall and very romantic and um, unignorant of the reality of 
Adirondack life at the time and the complexity, the po political complexity and the social and cultural from one town to the next, from one church to the next. And he exceptionalized it. The black agents exceptionalized it and saw something similar in their own hopes for it. Garnett's idea for this perfect system of agrarianism was ridiculous when every Adirondack or white or black quickly discovers that you can't make it on farming alone. You need to mix it up and do many things at once. So the more we can stay away from a kind of unitary, exceptionalizing understanding of this and not go for the easy, reductive vision. It was a you, it was an interracial utopia, or it was a nightmare. It was neither. It was an American mess. It was just a mess, and it was very, it was very um, classic in that respect, and very familiar. And we should get more comfortable with that idea. Things are really complicated. <laughs> can't simplify them and get the story. I, I imagine this is a, a complicated mm -hmm. answer as well. Um, Keegan Smith writes, uh, what prompted your own interest in studying Black history in the Adirondacks, given your own racial identity? Oh, I was, I don't remember what prompted it in the first place, Keegan. Honestly, you're, you're calling on an aging memory. I'm not sure I can remember <laughs> what first got me going. I think the first story I wrote was about Solomon Northup, and that was early on in the interest in Northup and just simply to discover he was an Adirondack born guy um, whose father lived in Minerva and that this free man of color had been kidnapped from Saratoga Springs and abducted for 12 years into slavery made me think this was a story worth pursuing. And it was really not a systematic, let's go to black history and, and own it. It was more it was more tail by tail. As I found people who interested me, I wanted to learn more about their discrete histories. And even now, I don't have any sort of systemic integrated view of Black history in the Adirondacks. It's way too diverse. It doesn't reduce that easily, I think. So I don't know that I answered that question, but that's as close as I can get. Uh Paula McClure writes, can you touch on the roles of the black women in these grantees families? Oh boy, I wish, I wish if there's a missing voice in this whole story and something I regret in my book, but don't know what to do anything about. It's the, it's the absence of black um, female voices. I get what I can from the census about black women stepping up during and after the civil war to assume money-making roles for their families when their husbands returned unable to do farming as they had before. And then you see women going to hotels, working as meat cooks, taking over farms, weaving, <coughs> doing several things to take their place in a market economy, but no voices. That's a different, that's a different thing. From a Civil War pension record, I get the story of a girl describing her mother, she's an old woman when she's describing her mother, but her mother is the wife of a grantee who comes up from the Hudson Valley. She has a big family. There's another fa grantee who lives not far from them, who comes up from Louisiana, who had been a slave and farms by herself. She falls in love with him and they move to New York City and marry. And the narrator of the story talks about it. And then when her husband, the second grantee, dies in New York, she comes back to the Adirondacks and moves in with her son, a veteran of the Civil War, and she lives the rest of her years in the Adirondacks and dies in, I think it's Wadhams, a tiny town. Do we have her perspective on her own experience? Not at all. We only have her daughter trying to explain to the pension guys why she has three last names and her, her story is really complicated and making sense of it for them. And that's how we happen to know about this romance in the woods. And boy, would I love to know more, but I don't have a source. I can't get there from here. It's tough. It, it, could, be, it could be its own book, really. It could be its own novel, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Along those lines, uh, excellent segue there. Um, Kate Bartlett writes, uh, thank you for this presentation. I get so much out of history through presentation and storytelling. Uh, she writes, she recently visited John Brown's farm. Uh, and then she goes on to say, I'm about 80 pages into Cloud Splitter by Russell Banks. Uh, without plot spoilers, would you please share your opinions of it as historical fiction? Well, I think it's a terrific book. Um, I don't think um, you need be dismayed to learn that a lot of the um, characters are reinvented for the author's needs and don't reflect the history we know about the very long-lived um, Lyman Epps, who does not live so long in this novel, for one thing. I happen to think um, the author was entirely within his rights to do what he wanted with this story, it was a work of the imagination, and he never pretends to be a historian. So even calling it historical fiction um, seems a little off the mark since, since Russell Banks was looking to bring a difficult character to life and understand the complexity of this remarkable man. And this, I think, he does more brilliantly than any historian I know. So I look for that deeper spark in the story to give me its truth, not for its fidelity to historical fact. Uh, there are uh, two somewhat related questions that uh, that I can uh, share here. One from uh, Steve Gertzler, uh, who writes, do any descendants of the original grantees still own land uh, here? And also Joan Spring, who writes uh, maybe more broadly, what happened to the descendants of the 200 plus black settlers who farmed in the Adirondacks? I'll take the second one first. Um, most of the descendants who who lived in the area seem to have moved away and are drawn to more urban areas where it's easier to get work and also to black communities in those areas. Um, and I can, I, I see that same pattern when I discover the, um, what happens to the children and grandchildren of Jewish immigrants to the Adirondacks who are here for a few generations and then generally have moved on to cities and to, uh, the comfort of a denser, pop, more diverse population. Um, do they do they advance economically? Not necessarily. I think they face the same inhibiting, um, biased problems in the cities that they face in the country. There's no escaping racism in any part of the country. The, there were there are descendants of grantees who may still live in the region. Whether they own land, I don't know. I don't know that they're farming. I don't know them. I didn't follow the story that long, but some Adirondackers have. And there are descendants of three principal families in my book who were around for a glorious um, reunion of families in Franklin some years ago. And that brought together both people in Saranac Lake and this family in a really heartening, warming way. But since then, I'm not aware of any other reunion that's occurred. It's a rare thing. Yeah. Uh, um, another historical uh, event uh, that we haven't really touched on, uh, Eric Lawson would like to know, uh, could you remark on the Civil War's influence on Black Adirondack history? Oh, absolutely. And that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting point. John Brown, his daughter said, had come to the Adirondacks in the first place partly to see if he could recruit uh, volunteers for a, an army, a small band of fighters he hoped to assemble who could join him in making war on slavery on its own ground. And he was unsuccessful in this respect among his black neighbors. He had one white family that sent volunteers to join him, but not, and his own family participated, but his black neighbors, at least Lyman Epps and possibly the Hazards said no. Um, some historians have treated this a little bit coldly, indicating or hinting that they didn't have the right stuff, they lacked his vision, they were too passive to take the chance and didn't have the courage to, to make this move. I don't see it that way at all. I think they made a brave and bold choice to come to the Adirondacks with no guarantee of success in this world in the first place, to stick it out, to build their communities and their families in safety and when their children are of age 
to fight in the Civil War and the Civil War opens up, um, they join. And there are many families I write about in the book who send sons or grantees to fight in both the colored troops and in white companies, even though this is against the law. Um, and that's an interesting story too, that several black Adirondackers who were light enough to pass as white also serve in white companies before the black regiments are formed. So there's eagerness to do their part, but they do it when um, their nation calls, not before. Uh, we have a couple more questions and, and maybe time to take uh, one or two more if others still have uh, questions. Uh, Jim Gould, uh, first of all, says he, he's enjoying the talk. He says, love the talk. Uh, and then uh, has a comment that he'd like your reaction to. He writes, the Adirondack landscape is so very tough economically on anyone from almost any time period. It must have been especially tough for poorly resourced black settlers. The growing season is short with killing frosts, uh, even in July, where markets and supplies were many days travel. Uh, we should probably be applauding those settlers of any ethnicity who realized that their prosperity was likely to be found elsewhere in lower elevations, closer to larger and div more diverse markets. Uh, and he just like your reaction to the, those thoughts. Couldn't agree more, Jim. You're right on the money. And um, I think new histories will probably emerge in the future to take a le less racialized view of this and explore it more in terms of class commonalities before, between extremely poor black Adirondackers and their extremely poor white neighbors. I don't think that's happening now. It doesn't really happen in my book to the extent it might have, but I can see that becoming a line of inquiry for a great scholar down the road. And Jim, maybe you're the guy to do it. <laughs> I know him, so tell him hi. <laughs> uh, and, and one more question. Uh, in the context of the trauma of housing insecurity placed on black and brown peoples, uh, that certainly ripples to contemporary times, to the GI Bill, redlining, etc. Right, right. Uh, do you know, is there any historical sense of how many times the average fugitive slave had to move in their lifetime to gain uh, safety? And, uh, and the questioner puts uh, heavy on the air quotes around the word safety. That's a great question. Um, I would direct that person to the folks at the Underground Railroad Museum who know this story better than I. You asked at the very beginning though, Mitch, about things I started with that I had to change. One was the assumption I inherited from a previous, the assertion I inherited from a previous Adirondack historian that there were no fugitive slaves in the Adirondacks. They weren't part of this story. This was about free black New Yorkers. It was never that simple. A number of the families that I, I researched had roots in slavery. They had parents who'd grown up in slavery. They had formerly enslaved grandparents who lived with the family, or they were themselves fugitives. One family, John Thomas, was pursued by a slave catcher into Franklin County, and only when his neighbors said, he's armed, he'll kill you if he sees you, and we'll take, we'll take his side too, did the guy go away. So it's a mixed bag. I find that um, the line between free and enslaved in New York in this era is very porous, and history has to respect this um, double quality of these lives where in the North, these grantees were regarded as free. They were residents of New York, but their owners in the South, if they had escaped, did not see them the same way. They were self-stolen property. So there you have a clash right there of how they figured both on the ground and in Adirondack history. Uh, we have one more question uh, from an audience member. Daniel Eisenberg writes, can you comment on Svensson's 2017 book on Blacks in the Adirondacks? Oh, it's a wonderful book. It was a great resource for me, and I used it all the time. And um, I don't agree with her assessment of Timbuktu. I think she thinks it was not an important episode but on that we're permitted to part ways. I think the research she did is it's a phenomenal resource for anybody looking to um, explore this history. Where I take a different turn is my interest in not just looking at black communities, black 
enclaves, black visitors and residents, but looking at white ideas about blackness that so influenced the black experience and that sometimes had nothing to do with black people on the ground, but everything to do with preconceived ideas of black Africans, um, ideas derived from blackface entertainments and comedy shows and, and Bible teachings and um, the portrayal of Africa and the South in school textbooks and so forth. So I'm interested in that side of it as well as the experience of black Adirondackers alone. I don't really think you can separate them very usefully. Uh, we had the one question earlier that mentioned a visit to John Brown's farm. And I guess I'm curious, uh, if you were so inclined to look for evidence of this history today, uh, where would you advise people to look? Oh, this is tough um, because it's a paper story, as I said, and directing people to go to the Essex County archives and go through lawsuits and <laughs> land claims is not a winning way to rouse interest, is it? So um, I think it's a story that calls for an enormous amount of imagination, imaginative exertion, or you can't call it to life. I mean, you can go to the cemeteries that pepper the region and look for the graves of um, grantees and their children. You can go to a church or two that might still stand where people worshipped. I don't know where you find the farms. I don't know where you find the pictures. They're not there. The material culture just isn't there. My friend Hadley Krusik Aaron has been digging for a long time for evidence of, of Lyman Epps's home. It's a really hard project when grantees, including Epps, move to better land. They don't settle on the land they were given. So you never know quite where to put your spade down. But she's sticking to it. Um, I, I can't do better than that. The places to look for are just not there. There's an inspirational story at the John Brown farm, but that's a white man's story. For the black story, it's pretty tough. Honestly. Well, we are we are truly grateful that uh, that you have brought so much of uh, of the black man's story and 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 the black women's story uh, to light in this book. Amy Godine, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And with that, I turn things back over uh, to Jenny Ambrose at the Adirondack Experience. Thank you for joining us for In the Adirondack Library. If you would like to hear more conversation between Amy Godin and Mitch Tyke, an earlier interview about the book is available on North Country Public Radio's website. We invite you back on December 11th, when we will feature the next book in the series, Making Camp, a visual history of camping's most essential items and activities. Dr. Martin Haug, a professor in Cornell University's Landscape Architecture Department, will discuss his fascinating research into the evolution of camping in the United States. To register for the program, follow the link in the chat or visit the ADKX website. A reminder, the full schedule for our monthly programs and information about the books and authors is available on our website. We hope to see you next month.